Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Stephanie Tran is our speaker tonight, and she'll be reviewing the importance of CBCT imaging in endodontics. If you have a question during the webinar, please type it into the box labeled have a question, and we'll do some live Q&A at the end. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this webinar live or on demand. Dr. Tran, take it away. Thank you so much, Adam. It's always a pleasure working with you. We've done a number of these CBCT lectures well, and other lectures together. It's always a blast. So I'm really looking forward to another one with you and Henry Schein. Thank you again to the whole Henry Schein team for having me again um, for your webinar series. And today, going to be exciting. It's a nice little kind of um, cap at the end of quite a few of my CBCT lectures. And today, we're going to be discussing CBCT in action, unveiling the mysteries of the tooth. For everyone who's joining me tonight, my name is Dr. Stephanie Tran. I'm an endodontist, and we're going to be really diving a little bit deeper into the CBCT concepts and how um, CBCT can be really important for better understanding uh, the better better understanding everything that happens within the tooth for diagnosis and treatment planning. Um, so, just for a little bit of disclosure, um, Henry Shine is is um, having me take part uh, for this presentation. Um, but uh, all these all the information that I'm presenting on the slides are my own opinion and my own experiences. Today, we're going to be discussing a lot of cases and I'm going to show you a lot of examples of how CBCT um, is important for diagnosis and treatment planning. So some of the things that we're going to be talking about are what are the key indicators for when a CBCT should be taken, um, how to understand uh, the anatomical structures, and how those structures can also hide important findings on 2D radiographs and how the 3D scans are so important for better diagnosis in many situations. Um, and we're also gonna be discussing the impact of incorporating 3D imaging in endodontics and what um, its advantages are over 2D. And within these discussions, I'm gonna show you quite a few cases with different findings that show um, how 3D scans can show more findings or show important findings that can make or break the diagnosis. For a little bit about me, like I said, I am an endodontist and I practice in New York City. But before I came to the Big Apple, I'm actually originally a Cali girl. I went to the University of the Pacific and I completed their 2 plus 3 accelerated bachelor's in DDS program. And after graduating, I um, went to a GPR at uh, Stony Brook Hospital here in New York. And that's where I fell in love with New York. At the GPR, as well as during my time at Pacific, we had a very strong focus on comprehensive care dentistry. And that is where my background in restorative dentistry and comprehensive care treatment, in addition to my experience in trauma, pediatric and special needs treatment, and um, emergency treatment came into um, to my experience. And because of my passion for comprehensive care dentistry, I worked as a GP for several years, which built on that foundation of comprehensive care and treatment. However, I did realize that my true love was endodontics. And so I completed a postgraduate program and specialty at the University of Tennessee, where I graduated as chief resident. And then now I've been in private practice in New York, servicing both the Hamptons and New York City itself. And what I do is I work with a number of restorative and cosmetic practices um, very closely with them so that we can provide the most um, patient-centered and specialist care level in the comfort of their offices. So one of the, not only do I speak with Henry Shine, but my, one of my other big passions um, besides endodontics itself, is endodontic education. So you can find me on Instagram at Her Holiness the Pulp. As you can tell, I definitely like dental puns. And on that Instagram, I do discuss um, dental education uh, and 
I also do deep dives into some of these cases that I'm going to be talking about, as well as I like to kind of show little fun videos or fun uh, like jokes or memes as well, if you enjoy that kind of fun that can be brought into dentistry. So let's start with the discussion of like the basics of 3D imaging. So I know that we had said in our, um, in our learning points, I'm going to be discussing like what are the indications as well as what are the, some of the basics. I'm not going to be able to go quite as deep into all those factors beca um, because we're going to focus on how CBCT can show the different findings and show different um, better understanding in certain areas. Um, but I do actually have a number of other lectures with Henry and Shine within their uh, webinar series. And so what you could do is um, contact Henry Shine or go on their website in their webinar series section and you can find my lectures and uh, sign up and they will, it will give you the link to watch and see some of them which are available on demand. A lot of those lectures will actually discuss a lot of the basics of how to do 3D imaging or uh, the other indications and basically when we use CBCT, why we use CBCT, how we use CBC. This lecture kind of puts all that information together and why CBCT can be so important in certain situations. So one of the things that we focus on is, well, when do we take it? We want to keep in mind that the AE and the AAOMR did publish a joint position statement in 2015 and 2016, which explains exactly the recommendations of when CBCT should be used. And keep in mind that CBCT should not be used routinely for endodontic diagnosis or for pure screening purposes in the absence of clinical signs and symptoms. It shouldn't just be used as a screening service uh, purpose for every single patient just because. It should be used um, when there is a need for the imaging that cannot be met with lower dose two-dimensional radiography. And we wanna keep that ALARA rule in mind. So basically we want to use CBCT when it's necessary. So when is it necessary? Well, it's very handy in many situations, preoperative diagnosis, preoperative treatment planning, evaluating the anatomy of both the um, uh, surrounding bony anatomy and the sinuses, as well as the canal anatomy and root anatomy itself. We, can al we also know that CBCT is very, very helpful for making very accurate measurements because we know that the images are geometrically accurate and it's excellent at evaluating the roots and the bone itself as well. So when we take a CBCT for the very basics on how we wanna take them for specifically for endodontic diagnosis, we, the main things to keep in mind are we want the smallest field of view possible, we want the smallest voxel size possible, and we want it in the correct location. So what does that mean? We want the best quality of information possible. So one of the misunderstandings that I often get as an endodontist is that either the restore, uh, referring dentist will just send over the CBCT and be like, can you just use this one for the diagnosis? Or a patient will tell me they've already had a CBCT taken with a surgeon for let's say implant treatment or some sort of surgery. And when I let them know that I may have to take a CT for my diagnosis, they're like, oh, if I already had one, can't use that. The reason why there are cer certain issues in those types of scans and why endodontic scans are a little bit different are that endodontics, we work in really, really, really tiny spaces. And so we need the highest resolutions possible. And the way to do that is the smallest field of view and the smallest box of size. So basically what are the like, smallest slices the machine can, can make? In general, you wanna be looking for either a machine or like the module, like the mode on the machine that can take a small field of view and the voxel size is usually like under 200 microns or under 100 microns. A lot of the newer machines nowadays can do under 100 microns. When they take the field of view, the reason why we want the smaller field of view and why it has a better resolution is because the smaller field of view focuses on just the tooth in question. Usually it's just a sextant. So like a very small area compared to like the entire arch or the entire head. When you have a smaller area, it focuses the beam 
And also there are there's less scatter and less interference by the other anatomy. So basically when you're in tight taking like the entire head or the entire arch, all the bone, all the cheeks, all the soft tissue, everything gets in the way and it actually affects the resolution. We want really good resolution because we need everything to be as clear as possible to be able to find all those tiny canals, to find to see all those little calcification and to see all those tiny curves and uh, differences within the PDL and the bone itself. So it's like basically the comparing an iPhone 6 to an iPhone 12's camera. It has a much higher resolution in the modern cameras. So like the pixel sizes are smaller, right? Like higher megapixels or whatever. So same thing when it comes to CBCT. Always make sure you have the highest resolution possible for better end diagnosis. Now, when we have all this information, is that everything under sun, including the misunderstanding of whether or not we can diagnose fractures and cracks? Actually, not always. So CBC is, of course, still so helpful and so um, advantageous in many situations, but it's not a magic wand. So when it comes to very, very fine fractures and cracks, yes, in this case that I'm showing you, we can see the crack. But if a crack is very, very, very fine, like a hairline fracture, it often does not appear on a CBCT because there isn't enough basically air space between other radio opaque structures between the root walls for you to be able to see the fracture itself. Um, a lot of times the crack has to be large enough to even show up on the CBCT. Additionally, especially when there is existing root canal filling material, it can also cause a lot of artifacts and interferences. It's called beam hardening that can actually block and uh, a lot of the fractures that are shown. And it's actually very difficult to be able to see the cracks. Um, even if it is big enough, sometimes it's hard to be able to see the crack itself because it's hidden under the, um, the beam hardening. So yes, we can see the crack, but some, uh, in this case, but what about if we couldn't see it due to certain beam hardening? Then what we're looking for instead is the bone loss around it that is uh, uh, coordinating with the fracture itself. So with those CVCT artifacts, that beam hardening um, is caused by any kind of radio-opaque materials within the tooth. And these, this beam hardening and the other artifacts caused by restorative materials and a root filling materials cause several issues. Not only does it cause these striations of beam hardening, you can kind of see it around the tooth here and here, um, and it could, could block possible fractures. It also is so white and so bright that it can make the root filling look larger than it is. So it's hard to adequately see how close it is to the root wall sometimes. And it's very hard to be able to differentiate levels of radio opacity. Sometimes you can't tell if it's a gut aperture versus a post or a like gut aperture versus a separated instrument, that kind of thing. Where you, whereas you see the differences in the radio opacity for, um, for, uh, 2D radiographs much better. So we want, so what can we do then? Well, we want to keep in mind, we need to um, look at all the different aspects of scans and 2D radiographs and put them together in conjunction with the clinical findings, the patient's reported symptoms, and all the testing. We also don't want to fall into easy uh, into, into easy misunderstandings or just kind of looking at every and painting everything with a broad brush. One of those biggest misunderstandings that we get in endodontics is that all J-shaped lesions are mean that it's a vertical root fracture. So if you don't take away anything from this lecture besides the fact that CBCT can be very advantageous in certain situations, please take away the fact that we want to take, use a small field of view for CBCT and you don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that all J-shaped lesions lesions that start at the apex and go up the side of the tooth mean that the tooth is fractured. When we're making these complicated kind of diagnoses in endodontics, we want to put all the information together. Part of that under information is, yes, under really understanding what the CBCT is telling us and what those kind of mysteries it's solving. So when we start off, we all usually start off, of course, with 2D radiography. So how do we use um, the 2D radiography in conjunction with CBCT for proper diagnosis? There's a lot of things that we're looking for. 
uh, as dentists, we know that we're having to look at many, many different factors um, and different aspects of a 2D radiograph uh, to be able to make proper endodontic diagnosis. I kind of go into depth with this information in other previous webinars, so definitely check those out. Um, now, when we use the 2D radiographs, yes, it can tell us a lot of things. However, it sometimes does have certain things that are e either unable to be seen on, a, on the 2D radiograph due to the anatomy or, um, or overlap of other uh, anatomical structures or just the way the bone is or even just the angle of the radiograph. So it has certain disadvantages. For bone loss, including periapical radiolucencies, which are going to be the most common thing that we're going to be looking for when we're looking for the bone treatment, and, and we often may require a certain amount of bone to be lost before uh, the before the lesion can even be seen on the radiographs. So, for example. Basically, we understand in dental school, we're always told that what we see on the radiograph is not as bad as what's in the mouth uh, for real. So, for example, if there's caries, there's actually that caries lesion may look a certain size on the radiograph, but it's actually even larger clinically. The same goes for bone loss as and uh, periapical radiolucency sizes on a 2D radiograph versus a 3D. There does need to be, the lesion does need to be a certain size for the lesion to show up on a 2D radiograph. Now there is a little bit of a misunderstanding about how much bone loss there needs to be and how much bone loss there needs to be like through the cortical plate. There's a kind of a misunderstanding because very old literature said that at least 40% of the cortical plate need to be gone before you can see it on the radiograph. I think the mis part of that misunderstanding was based on um, the kinds of x-rays that were used at the time, so conventional like film radiographs. It actually does, uh, we know from current endodontic literature, it actually does not require that much bone to be lost, um, but the uh, exact amount actually varies within where the tooth is within the, the jaw, um, how much bone or how much bony plate there is in front of it, how thick it is, what kind of bone, um, the anatomical structures that are uh, overlapping, the apex, that kind of thing. So it, it basically, it depends. However, it still um, is a fact that you need more bone to be lost to be able to see it. So basically, a lesion is clearer on a 3D scan. Additionally, um, 2D radiographs have some other issues about being able to visualize the peri perigo radiolucencies because of um, the, the 3D structures, the 3D anatomical structures and the tooth itself are more compressed looking within a 2D radiograph. There's going to be some distortion. We know that there can be some elongation or some foreshortening. And there's often a lot of anatomical overlap or anatomical artifacts that can block um, the diagnosis to, be, diagnosis to be properly made. We also know that CBCT has a much better ability to detect the actual periapical pathosis. So like we're saying, if the size is going to be more accurate on a 3D scan, the exact location and extent of it is going to be far clearer. And this is evident in quite a few of the endodontic papers. So putting all this information together, what are the advantages and how do we use CBCT to show a lot of the findings much better and how CBCT is so advantageous in certain ways. Well, first, we need to understand how to use the CBCT. So we are looking for quite a few things. Reading CBCT and the art of diagnosis on CBCT can be quite complex. This is just a short list of quite a few of the things that we're looking at. We're I'm trying to uh, look at very much similar ideas and concepts as 2D radiographs. However, we are we need to see the full 3D extent of everything. We need to best understand the other anatomical structures around the tooth and looking at the full 3D form and 3D structures of the tooth and the anatomy itself. Um, so it can get quite complex. And then when we're looking within the tooth itself, we're also looking at the canals, how they are in relation to the root itself, where they go, what are the 
um, and the anatomical shapes, the calcifications, the curvatures, and the roots themselves. So 3D, 3D scan understanding and um, interpretation can be quite complex. And then we're also evaluating the bone around the tooth itself, which again, we're looking at all aspects of it, including the PDL, the lamina dura, and the surrounding uh, cortical and cancellous bone. And we want to see exactly where the bone loss and, and extent is. And we want to look at any kind of root fillings and restorative materials that are within the tooth to best understand um, how the, the tooth has been treated and if there are any issues with it. So when we're looking at those 2D versus the 3D findings, we can see that the three-dimensional uh, scans have many advantages. So the way I'm going to be discussing it is like what the indications are and why CBCT is indicated as the imaging modality of choice. And, and because it's the recommended choice as one of the main ways to best make the diagnosis, it's going to be um, really important to understand why it's so valuable in those situations. So first off, when it comes to preoperative diagnosis, CBCT should be considered the imaging modality of choice in, in very complex diagnosis. So diagnosis in situations where there are contradictory or nonspecific signs, if there are inconclusive findings, or if the, basically the symptoms don't really match uh, what is able to be seen both clinically and on the 2D radiograph. So what are some of those ways? Well, one is going to be in non-odontogenic lesions. If for some reason the symptoms are not met matching that there's a presence of a lesion, we definitely want to take a CBCT. So for example, in this case, this was my patient who had a lesion that was noted for several years. It, it's noted to have very defined bony borders and that appear to be close to the pulp if, uh, and, and the apex. If we didn't do testing and we didn't do a full clinical evaluation and radiographic diagnosis of this tooth, somebody could easily jump into this tooth because, oh, it has a lesion, it should need a root canal. However, this is why testing is super important. All, the mag all these anterior teeth tested vital and normal to periapical and had normal periapical tissues. That doesn't match the presence of a lesion because normally if it is an odontogenic lesion associated with the apex of a tooth, um, it's generally associated with a, a pulp that is necrotic or an existing root canal treatment because there's no vital pulp. So we took a scan and the CBCT shows that this radiographic uh, finding appears to actually be away from the center of the apex of the tooth. We can see it's actually off-centered. If it's odontogenic, it should generally be centered, not just to the apex, but centered specifically to the apical foramen or apical exit itself, because that makes sense. The lesion should be going to um, coming from where the canal is exiting. However, we can see that this lesion was separate. So this patient was recommended to have pathology um, biopsy it because we can see this lesion actually is separate from the apex with even a bony separation. And the pathology had determined this was actually a nasopalatine duct cyst. So it's, this patient did not need endodontics and the importance of the CPCT shows uh, to confirms that the patient did not need endodontic treatment and we saved the patient both money and an invasive uh, non uh, like a, a, a treatment that can't be undone. Um, additionally, CBCT is extremely helpful for diagnosis of either severe pain that's very very hard to localize, or or pain that can that seems like it could be masked in other areas or hard to visualize on the two D radiograph. So we know that CBCT, as we had discussed, shows far more periapical radiolucencies than conventional radiographs, and it's far more sensitive than conventional PA x-rays. So we can see on the 2D x-ray on the left that this tooth you know, um, appears to not really have any obvious periapical radiolucencies. It's not really, really clear. 
um, this patient doesn't have any really large caries or other findings of why they would be having pain. But then when we, because of that, we want to confirm it with a radio, with a CBCT to con compare that to the radiographs because the patient had pain in the upper left, but it wasn't really clear as to why. And so we, when we take a CBCT, it can show us periapical radiolucencies far more clearly with a higher level of sensitivity. We can see in the CBCT scan here, I have put on a few slices of it, we can see two major findings. One is that the there's this kind of like bulging radio opaque area. That is the sinus, the dark area is the sinus, and the radio opaque area is the mucosal lining of the sinus. So what actually happens with um, endodontic issues with teeth is that they can actually cause mucosal irritation and mucosal um, uh, sinus inflammation. And so we'll see that mucosal thickening in a CBCT. When we see it associated with a tooth that may be having some sort of odontogenic uh, issue, some sort of endodontic related issue, then it can help us confirm which tooth is the one causing the, the, um, the patient's chief concern. So we can see in the, in the CBCT scan, in another slice, that there is this slightly widened apical PDL. And we know that it's widened compared because when you compare it to everything else, everything else has an intact lamina dura and the PDL is more of an even uniform width, but it's widened only in that area. So that in conjunction with endodontic testing helped confirm that the tooth that was causing the issue was actually the second molar and not the first molar. But we can see the difference, the very clear difference in this case, um, the uh, how evident it is to see the periapical radiolucency and to see those periapical lesions much, much more clearly on a CBCT, whereas in the 2D radiograph, it's far fuzzier, it's far more um, uh, covered by the different anatomical structures. And so with that overlap, it makes it really hard to be able to diagnose those lesions. Other uh, times that it's very helpful to use a CBCT is, again, to identify periapical radiolucency and making sure which tooth is causing the patient's chief concern. So this is especially important when we want to make sure we don't want to be tricked into thinking it's coming from another tooth. And this case that I'm going to be showing you is a classic situation of that. So this patient presented with severe pain in the upper left. Now, this patient did not have swelling, did not have a sinus tract, did not have any deep uh, probing depths. And this patient did ha didn't have any obvious giant caries or other things that would kind of be a glaring um, arrow at which tooth is causing it. When we took the 2D periapical radiograph, we can see that number 14, so the first molar, has that radiolucency. So if you just looked at the radiograph and kind of glanced at it, a lot of dentists would just immediately jump into redoing tooth number 14 or even just recommending an extraction for some reason and placing an implant because that seems like, well, it's obvious as a lesion. However, this is why CBCT and testing are so important to be done in conjunction with one another to make an accurate diagnosis. So again, this is a, a situation where um, a CBCT plus the endodontic testing were so key into making that diagnosis and identifying exactly uh, where the periapical radiolucency could be and if there's any un undiagnosed pathoses. So when we did the endodontic testing, the vitality testing, we noted that tooth number 15 actually had the most severe pain to percussion and it had no response to cold. However, it does not have existing root canal filling material, which is why number 14 didn't have, obviously wouldn't have any response to cold. So it appears the symptoms were most coming from tooth number 15, the second molar. But the CBCT shows it even better. We can see in the serial slices here at the bottom that we can actually see those two things that we were talking about in the other case. One is that mucosal thickening here right above the apices of the tooth. And two, we can see this radiolucency at the apices of, of tooth on the second molar, which is in conjunction um, and in relation to that mucosal thickening. 
we can see as we look at the different slices. So for example, as I scroll through the different slices on the CBCT, we see that difference in that uh, in that apex, that widened PDL and that periporadiolucency is even far more evident. And then we can see on there the mucosal thickening and the periporadiolucency, and we can see it from other angles as well. So we can see that the apex is right up against the buccal plate for that distal buccal root, and then it act that lesion actually perforates through the uh, buccal plate. So it is even more of a clear finding. So that in conjunction with the vitality testing, that tooth number 15 is the actual cause of the and etiology of the patient's chief concern. So number one, we save the patient like two endodontic treatments. So doing 15 and 14 or may, doing the wrong one. Now, does that mean 14 may need to be redone? Possibly, but at this point, time it's asymptomatic when treating the tooth we want to make sure that we are focusing on the patient's chief concern let them know about the other finding and that there may be um, additional endodontic disease but we are focusing on the patient's chief concern so this number 15 was the clear cause of the patient's chief concern in this case so we completed the endodontic treatment and we can see here um, that the that severe curvature and that really interesting anatomy in the distal buckle as well as the exact location of the puff where the lesion was everything in the cbct matches what it looks like on the 2d radiograph but we see we saw so much more information on 3d scan than we did on the 2d radiograph more ways that a cbct can be really helpful is when the symptoms are so hard to match. So earlier I was explaining different situations where the symptoms kind of pointed to it, but it was still really helpful to have a CBCT to be absolutely sure we're not choosing the wrong one. Earlier with the other case, we could have easily had doubts that tooth number 14 was the cause because of that radiolucency at the mesiobuccal apex. However, sometimes when a patient is in so much pain, it's hard for them to make an accurate response when you're doing the sensibility testing because sometimes everything hurts so much or sometimes the patient has referred pain, it's really hard for them to tell. This case that I'm show, going to show you is a clear, is a very good example of that. For this patient, they came in as an emergency that had severe, severe pain in the lower right area They could and they just could not localize and figure out where the pain was coming from. Again, it was a situation where no clear signs of which tooth was causing it because there were no swelling or sinus tracts, there was no deep probing depths, and there was a crown covering this tooth, So, and the other teeth also had certain restorations as well. There were, none of them had gross caries or obvious fractures. However, when we did the vitality testing, that didn't even help because percussion and palpation had so much severe pain in the area, it was really hard to delineate exactly which tooth was the one causing the pain. When we did the sensibility testing for the cold test, tooth number 30 did not respond to cold, but the patient really didn't have a very good response to tooth number 31, so it just wasn't really, really clear exactly which tooth was the cause of the patient's pain. And this is why a CBCT came so in handy for um, this kind of case. As we can see from scrolling through this case, we took a CBCT that was a local uh, a limited field of view. So it was a smaller field of view right in the area. And we can see that for tooth number 30, which is the first molar, there's actually a much clearer pair April radiolucency that isn't really that clear on the 2D radiograph. We can see as we scroll through the slices that that 2D um, the 2D imaging did not show that uh, fairly significant periapical radiolucency, but on the 3D scan, we can see it, see it far more clearly. On the 2D, I could have made a argument that there was definitely possibly a widened PDL because the patient had so much pain, it was really hard to distinguish which tooth was causing it. So having a, the CBCT, it was so important to this case where now we knew for sure that tooth 
that the first molar had the periporeal lucency that made sense with the testing and the lack of response to, to cold and confirming the pulpal necrosis. Additionally, we can see in the bottom left image that we can see the two black dots. This tooth also had really interesting anatomy. For a first molar, generally we would be expecting um, two, at least three canals. But very interestingly, this patient only had two obvious canals matching the, uh, the CBCT. So again, this saves us the fact that we, in a different situation, because we are normally expecting first molars to have at least three or even four canals, sometimes we would have made the mistake of continuing to prep and prep and prep and accessing and accessing and extending that access further to try to find that third, that second mesial canal or second distal canal. So by having that CBCT, it showed not only clearly which tooth was causing it, it was showing a clear understanding of what the anatomy looked like, where the canal should be and how to look for them so that we would only be looking for two canals. And additionally, even from the CBCT that it's split very uh, slightly in the apex. And we can see that very obviously here in the post-operative radiograph where there was an apical delta or apical split. Um, here, yes, we can see a little bit more clearly on the 2D radiograph that there was a widened PDL, but because of the bone pattern from the pre-operative radiograph, as we can see here, it's very hard to see due to the overlap of the um, anatomical structures and the bony plate and the cortical um, and cancellous bone that it was really hard to absolutely tell exactly how much wide apical widening there was. You can, it's still always going to be really, really important to be able to read the grays to make adequate 2D diagnosis for endodontic treatment. These cases though show when the 2D can have some flaws or some mistakes in if you just made very, very quick perusals of diagnosis and why a CBCT is so helpful to make a much more accurate diagnosis in these cases. And um, so part of that may adequate diagnosis and a better understanding of the tooth is when we want to make the diagnosis prior to doing endodontic treatment to better understand the anatomy. And that's because the AAE and AAOMR do recommend that a limited field of view CBCT should be considered the imaging modality of choice for um, teeth that may be suspected to have really unusual anatomy, complex morphology, um, and that kind of thing. And so that way, way we can better know exactly how many canals there are and where to find them. So for example, one of the most uh, interesting Complex anatomies for me as an endodontist are cases where the canals are somewhat fused or there's some sort of fusion of the roots and sort of the C-shaped canal system because these make it very, very complex to do both the diagnosis, to do adequate cleaning and shaping, and to do adequate um, obturation as well. So for this patient, uh, this patient came to me with a chief concern of having a sinus tract on the buckle. And we can see from the 2D radiograph that there's definitely a concern of a periapical radial lucency, a fairly large one on the distal. And in this case, it has that big red flag and that big scary sign of being kind of J-shaped. So it starts from the apex and goes up the side of the tooth on one side, either like oh, mesial or distal or buccal or lingual. When it goes up the side of the tooth like that, there are many things that can be considered um, as part of the differential diagnosis. A cracked tooth is one of them, but also perioendo lesions and that kind of thing. When we did the in intraoral evaluation, we noted that this tooth didn't have very large caries, it has that existing um, restoration on there. It had a sinus tract. However, it did not have any typical findings associated with um, a fracture. It didn't have a deep probing depth. It didn't have any obvious fractures, cracks, um, issues with transillumination or staining. And when we did the testing, tooth number 31 was the necrotic, uh, did find, it was found to have a necrotic pulp and it did have percussion and a little bit of palpation tenderness in that area. 
in this case, it's not a question of which tooth is causing it, but why the lesion is being caused at all. The diagnosis in this case was pulpal necrosis with a chronic apical abscess. However, the differential diagnoses that we discussed earlier of a possible crack or perioendo issue were still um, a consideration. Additionally, we can see that this patient definitely had really unusual occlusion. This picture is not just that the tooth is slightly out of alignment, that you're actually looking at the tooth lit, um, on its occlusal, but it's severely tilted lingually. With that really, really severe tilt, we may be more concerned about the possibility of some sort of um, malocclusion or uh, improper occlusion that could cause a fracture or crack or some sort of perioendolesion as well, because it's lingually tilted, it's at an area that was clearly very difficult for this patient to clean, and so these are all still possible factors. Because of the shape of the 2D radiograph and the possibility of perioendor or a cracked tooth, a CBCT was recommended and it was recommended to evaluate the anatomy. We can see the anatomy of the canal system is really, really unusual as well because it the canals seem to like kind of come together and in the mid root area, it's kind of like fuzzy. Is it like three separate canals? Is it, um, and it, that doesn't really make any sense for a second molar. Why does it look like that? So again, the CBCT is very helpful in this case. We can see from the CBCT here, that there are several findings. First, we the reason for that kind of shade, uh, like weird shading and fuzziness right in the middle is because this tooth has a classic presentation of a C-shaped canal system. A C-shaped canal system means that instead of having separate roots and separate canals into each root, the roots are kind of fused together here. There's going to be a little bit more of a groove here on the buckle. And then the canals themselves, instead of being separate, it's actually a whole sheath of pulpal tissue that makes a very clear C shape. However, the problem with these kind of kind of conical roots or C shaped canal systems, because the roots come together, is that these teeth are actually more prone to cracks and fractures. So not only is this tooth severely lingually tilted, but it has a certain anatomical finding that makes it also more prone to cracks. So And so with a very large lesion like this, again, I was very concerned about the possibility and suspicion of a cracked tooth or periendo, which is why we recommended a CBCT to better understand exactly what might be going on. So we can see from the scan here, as we scroll through the slices in this limited field of view, to, so that we could have the highest resolution possible. We can see that lesion. We can see that that lesion comes up the side of the tooth, but it seems to not completely join to the alveolar ridge, which is a good sign. That means that it makes sense with the lack of a deep probing. We can see that that lesion comes to the side and perforates through the bony plate, as well as we can see exactly the shape of that C-shaped sheath of pulpal tissue. We want to keep in mind that when we see these C-shaped um, canal systems, these are extremely hard to clean because we can see here that these canals started from like that kind of C-shape that was all continuous. So now you have all these isthmuses and anastomoses that can harbor debris and tissue, and they need to be adequately cleaned out. But also the canals now separate at the end or in the mid root and with C-shaped the canals, they can join and separate and join and separate and have different anatomy all within the same tooth. This makes it very difficult to clean and very difficult to obturate. Having this 3D uh, scan helps me better understand exactly where I can expect the canals to be, where can I have expected them to join and then also separate, and then also where I was expecting for them to exit. In this case, it does appear that the apical foramen appears to coincide with this lesion, which makes it, again, feel like it should be a lesion of endodontic origin. And so the suspicions of a possible fracture or crack or possible paraendo are still possibly there, um, but we let the patient know that it did not appear to have a crack or an obvious perioendo issue. And so that's why this patient went forward with maintaining this tooth. 
So we can see from this 2D radiograph that that 3D scan showed a much, much better view and understanding of what the canals would look like. So that way we were better prepared into going into this tooth and completing the endodontic treatment and proper full obturation. We can see here that the um, that there's sort it looks like it's three canals, but it kind of becomes kind of fuzzy in certain areas. And that's because that's the gutta percha and obturation material filling in those fins and sheath areas that had been cleaned out. The other interesting thing for this tooth is because uh, of my, uh, as I had explained, restore, for restorative dentistry, we want to really maintain that conservative kind of considerations. And with this patient, because this tooth was so lingually tilted, I couldn't access from the lingual. So just as an interesting thing, as we can see here, I actually, actually accessed from the buckle of this tooth into the molar. Because this tooth was so lingually tilted, I actually accessed basically through the mesial buccal cusp and was able to access into all aspects of the C-shaped canal system to do adequately adequate cleaning and shaping in an in a way that also respects the patient's occlusion and restorative concerns as well. Things come into play when be, because we had that better understanding through a CBC scan. Now, another reason why we may want to use a CBCT is when the pulp has severe calcifications or some, some sort of pulp canal obliteration. It's those situations when a CBCT should again be the main modality of choice for identification and local, uh, location of the calcified canals. We have several examples of this. I have one case here where this patient had a very large lesion and um, we can see in this case that the canal just kind of suddenly disappears right in the middle of the root. That's called pulp canal obliteration. It clearly has a lesion, but here in that mid middle area of the root canal system, all of a sudden that, um, that central's, uh, central tooth's canal system is completely gone in the coronal to mid root area and does not even appear to have a canal until the very apical several millimeters. The other concern is that we can see even from the other slice angles that the canal is very, very hard to localize until the very apical few millimeters. We can also see from this 3D scan that canal is basically inaccessible until the apical portion. There's a very, very large lesion here, and that lesion actually perforates through the uh, palatal bone, and that lesion extends to um, the lateral tooth as well. So having that CBCT shows us such a better understanding of not only that there's a lesion, but exactly where it extends to. Because on the 2D radiograph, we can't see where it extends to buccolingually. Because of the size of the lesion, it looks like, oh, okay, maybe it might not be that as involved. However, the CBCT shows that clearly not only does is the lesion excessively large, but even more importantly, a tooth with a large lesion of endodontic origin can be treated. However, a tooth that's completely, completely calcified may be unable to be treated. And then this having the CBCT scan was very, very helpful in making um, the treatment planning process for this tooth as well. Because we know that this canal was not visible on the 2D radiograph, we're ex su suspecting severe calcification, and that was confirmed with the 3D scan. We know that this tooth is going to be very, very difficult to treat non-surgically because it would really require a 3D guided stent to even be able to find the canal. How There's no way for anyone to non-surgically access this tooth through the incisal area and extend um, an access like 20, 23 millimeters down the tooth where there's no canal, right? So having that CT helped save us trying to kind of hunt and, and like get lost in trying to find the canal. But then the CBCT also shows us that because it's so calcified in the coronal portion, then the only consideration would be some sort of surgical treatment, but some sort of surgical treatment would be a bit of a concern because of how large the bony extent was 
and how it extends both buccally and lingually, having a through and through lesion, having a very, very, very thin uh, layer of bone left and almost no bony collar left and other factors that actually keep adding to a poor prognosis. So with all these findings, thanks to CBCT, we, um, the patient and oral surgery and I co collaborated in making the decision and the patient made an informed uh, decision to actually choose to have the tooth extracted, the lesion um, removed and curataged out. And so that way they could send it out for pathology. Another situation of why it's helpful to have a CBCT when a tooth is excessively calcified is that it might seem like it's, it is possibly visible on a 2D radiograph or it's not as clear, but on a 3D scan, the, Severe, the severity of calcification is even more evident as well as if it is evident on CBCT, that means it's definitely really, really, really difficult to access and it may be too difficult to access um, for a non-surgical treatment. So this helps us have not only a better understanding for a patient, but it also means that it helps better understand what their options are. We can then cut out certain options that may have a poor prognosis or more difficult time to do. In situations like this, when a tooth is so calcified that the canal system is completely um, invisible on a 3D scan, the, those are situations where we may have to either consider some sort of surgical treatment, a 3D guided stent, if there's a way to even figure out where to put the 3D guide, or the other possibilities of extraction um, or other kind of treatment modalities. But having a CBCT to make help us better make that decision and better um, rule out certain decisions is very, very helpful. Another reason why CBCT is the imaging modality of choice is for um, resorptive defects. So anytime we're suspecting some sort of resorption situation, we want to take the CBCT because there's no way for us to adequately figure out exactly the extent of the resorption. Additionally, by having that better understanding of the resorption, we can make a better assessment of what the prognosis would be and whether or not it's necessary to treat the tooth. So for example, in this case, I had a patient who presented to me with um, a referral for a possible endodontic treatment. Interestingly, not for the external cervical invasive resorption, but for the large mesial caries that this patient had on the second molar. So this patient was referred to me for the possible treatment. They reported they didn't have any kind of pain, any kind of sensitivity, and that they just had this hole in the tooth where the caries was, and that they were referred for possible endodontic treatment. The 2D radiograph we can see here shows, you know, the sh general shape of the canals. It generally shows that the general dentist was correct in being concerned about the extent of the caries. It does look like it is quite close to the pulp horn. And, however, we can see this very unique finding in that there's sort of this radiolucency in the distal cervical area. It's kind of diffuse. It's not, it doesn't have really clear borders and it, looks like it's even kind of separate from the pulp chamber. We can see that we can uh, that there's kind of like this line right on the distal where the pulp chamber is. And this is a sign of like the possibly the lesion on the distal being slightly separate from the pulp canal space. Now, the problem is that when we see kind of these like distal or cervical lesions, we want to make sure whether or not it's caries or ECIR, external cervical invasive resorption. We did the testing. This tooth had very slight symptoms to cold with slight lingering, um, but again, it wasn't anything super severe, so this patient was a bit concerned. We took a CBCT because I could see that radiolucent area in the, cer in the cervical portion of the tooth, and I suspected ECIR, and sure enough, we can definitely see that external cervical resorption was an issue for this tooth. So we can see here that as I do my slices and I scroll through the slices in this tooth, we can see that this starts in the distal portion right at the cervical level, matching a classic ECIR presentation. We can see that that resorption defect 
really show is seen exactly how um, the extent of sorry the we know exactly the extent of that resorption defect thanks to CVCT. The problem with a 2D radiograph is that we can't always see exactly the extent of resorption defect. In this case, we could see that not only it was extensive from the distal towards into the mesial portion and towards the pulp chamber, but again, we can see that it extends uh, internally into the tooth, mesially even all the way to the other side, as well as palatally, and then it extends not only palatally, palatally, but then apically as well. So it's very extensive. It extends into the palatal root, so there's now very little root structure left if removal was attempted. And we can see from the other slices that it really thins out the furcation as well. So we can know, thanks to a CVCT, that this lesion is actually far more extensive than we thought it was on compared to the 2D radiograph. And so it's all the more reason um, not to necessarily treat a tooth with ECRR this extensive. This is probably more like a hither say class three. Because when resorption defect is too deep or too extensive, if we were to try to remove it, there'd be too little tooth structure left and the tooth would have very poor prognosis and high risk of fracturing. Taking a CBCT helped save this patient invasive treatment. We did not attempt endodontic treatment and we recommended either for, end, uh, for extraction or for the mesial caries to be removed and for the pulp to be monitored for possible symptoms and then extraction to be done if symptoms did arise. And we can see that understanding these resorptive defects is so key, important to be done with a CBCT. We, even in areas where, okay, maybe it's not that bad, maybe it's not that big, it seems like it's mostly in the cervical area, for example, on this 2D radiograph, we can see in the 3D scan that it's actually, again, quite extensive. This is another case with ECIR, and it's very clear that it extends quite far internally into the tooth right from the cervical area. ECIR, again, is caused by inflammation um, of the ligament that extend, is extending into the tooth. And due to the extent, when it extends into the tooth so severely like this, there may not be enough tooth left to maintain. And lastly, when we use uh, CBCT, it's really important when we're trying to decide whether or not retreatment should be done if we're, um, or if we're suspecting certain fractures or we're using it for surgical treatment. So we want to definitely use it when we're concerned about the possibility of misanatomy or fractures and when we're treatment planning a retreatment. So for example, this is a, a case that I've shown in my other um, webinar courses where this patient did present with some pain, some discomfort on the palatal side of this tooth. It feels like it was a little swollen. She had, however, this very deep probing depth on the palatal and a little bit of swelling in that area, but not buccal vestibular swelling. Because of that, it that means, according to the 2D radiograph, that there's a deep probing and this kind of possibility of a periapical radiolucid means you buccal. Maybe the lesion and maybe the palatal bone loss is just due to um, an endodontic lesion that is extending up the palatal. Maybe it's due to the fact that this tooth didn't have treated mesiobuccal canals. So we wanted to take a CBCT to be sure exactly how calcified the canals would be, how severe the situation was, and where the periapical radiolucency was actually coming from. We see that this tooth wasn't treated fully, so there's always the possibility that radiolucency is, the what, is what's causing the sinus tract, not a fracture or perioendo. However, the CBCT tells another story. We can see here that there is quite a bit of bone loss on the palatal and around the palatal root all the way towards the buccal portion of the palatal root. We can see that, that, that there is a widened PDL in the midroot area as well, and the possibility of a fracture of this palatal root, that's what that uh, kind of wiggly dark line could be. This is a reason why we suspected that unfortunately, uh, this tooth was most likely fractured, but not just because we can possibly see the white line. 
and that could be also due to beam hardening, but because we see such severe bone loss on both sides, which is why we recommended an extraction. And again, this saved the patient invasive endodontic treatment and trying and chair time. Um, another situation is when we're trying to see exactly how much bone loss there is, and we can see on the CBCT that it's going to be far worse. Um, however, it's an, in this case, it's another situation of bone loss on this mesobuccal root, a, a periapical radiolucency that we can see on the 2D radiograph, and we can see that it might have a widened PDL on the um, on the lingual, on the distal portion of the mesiobuccal root, there was a little bit of swelling and deep probing on the mesiobuccal in the clinical findings. And so and, um, we can see that there's you know, quite a bit of vertical bone loss. However, with situations like this, or it could be just a really, really large lesion of endodontic origin that's coming up both sides of the apex that could be what's causing this deep probing, this kind of like widened PDL on both sides. So again, it's part of our differential diagnosis that this lesion extending up the side of the tooth or having some vertical bone loss does not automatically mean that it's a vertical root fracture. However, because it wasn't 100% sure and that there was the possibility of a missed MB2, when we took the CBCT to confirm those findings, we actually see that this tooth has severe bone loss completely all the way down the root in the frication area as a mid root. Um, wide in PDL as well, severe bone, vertical bone loss all the way to uh, the apex, but kind of separately. The apical portion has its own round centered lesion as well. So putting those two things together, an apical lesion on its own, wide in PDL and a, a vertical of this root, even though I can't see a fracture separately in this case, this kind of um, finding and this kind of presentation of bone loss does confirm that it's consistent with a vertical root fracture. We can also see that the root filling material in the musical buccal root is very, very thin, and that makes sense to match um, that there may be a fracture. So in those kind of findings, the CBCT was so important at unveiling the mystery of why this patient had the deep probing depth and that it was not due, a, due to a missed canal, but due to actually a likely vertical root fracture. Um, in this case, another, another example of how a CBCT taken after a tooth has had endodontic treatment and we're assessing for the possibility of retreatment is really important. Um, in this case, we can see that this tooth has root canal filling material. It has a root canal filling material in all the roots. It looks like it's pretty well done. Maybe a little, yes, it's a little short on the distal buckle, but nothing severe. We can definitely see a, vert, a, a radiolucency very clearly in the apical portion. And so it looks like it's fairly centered, that radiolucency, which makes us think that it could possibly be um, a lesion of anodonic origin. However, when a patient presents with these kinds of findings and an existing root canal filling material, um, it's always good to take a CBCT to, add, to adequately assess if the root canal filling material has any issues and what, why it might be causing a periphery lucency, if that there is a missed MB2, that kind of thing. So, for example, in this case, this patient had pain, they had... Um, they didn't have a swelling or sinus tract. They had existing restoration. And again, the possibility of a missed MB2 because it looks like it's slightly off-centered for this tooth. The lesion, I'm sorry, the root canal filling is slightly off-centered. There's a possibility that there could be a missed canal. So we want to take a CBCT to best evaluate that. When we took the CBCT, we can actually see that there are many findings in the CBCT that actually helped us make a decision and prevented us from doing invasive treatment unnecessarily. So in this case, we can see that the root canal filling material is quite large and very close to the side of the root wall um, in that mesiobuccal root. We can also see that it's very close to that furcation portion um, from another angle. Because it's so close to that uh, portion, even though, yeah, the canals are a little short, um, and yes, this tooth looks like it had the canal completely treated or mostly treated. It's, there are no missed canals. However, when we see such a thin root like that, 
we know that we would not recommend endodontic retreatment because there's just too much uh, tooth structure lost. And when there's too much tooth structure lost, by the time we go in for a retreatment, it's going to definitely strip perf or still have such a high risk of fracture at that time that it's actually within the patient's best interest not to treat the tooth. So again, a CBCT was so helpful in this case to save us from having to do additional treatment for this patient that did not need to be done and help save the patient invasive treatment that needs to be done. So this CBCT was so helpful in better understanding that. As we can see here from all these different cases, which I know we kind of flew through. So if you have any questions for me, definitely feel free to contact me or um, see my other webinars for more information. We definitely talked about what all the indications for CVCT are, how they are advantageous compared to 2D radiographs, and how to interpret them for better understanding. Um, we can see that it's very advantageous, but it does need to be used in conjunction with all the different findings, the different um, symptoms, and the 2D radiographic findings as well to really make that diagnosis. It's just that having the CBCT can sometimes be a key factor in really making the proper diagnosis. So um, I know that was a lot of information that we went through. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to contact me at my email or follow me on Instagram where I will actually chronic education. And I post when I'm going to be doing other webinars and lectures, including some hands-on portions as well. So definitely check my account out for more information. If you have any other questions, definitely feel free to reach out to Henry Shine for my other webinars as well. And um, thank you so much to all of you for joining me tonight. I know it's a late night for a lot of the people on the East Coast, but we definitely wanted to make it available for people on the West Coast as well. And actually, it's kind of a late night for me here in Italy because I'm, uh, but I wanted to really make sure I brought some endodontic education for everyone and the whole Henry Shine team. So thank you again to Henry Shine and to Adam. I'll bring it off to you. Excellent. Thank you. Burning that 3 a.m. oil over in <laughs> Italy. Certainly appreciate Only it. Only for you guys. Only for you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we do have a couple <laughs> questions here. Um, the first one is, do you send your CT scans to a radiologist? That's a great question. Um, so I can definitely understand why you would be asking or why there would be that question. And that's because the um, there is the necessity of sending it to a radiologist if there are certain really large scans being done, or if there are uh, certain findings that are not really clear. The great thing about endonic CBCTs in particular, um, uh, the, the great thing about endodontic CBCTs in particular are that they are a small field of view, so they are a sextant, like a very small area. That is generally um, the equivalent of like a few PA. So, most of us as dentists can be able to understand all findings in a, C in a very small CBCT like that without having to send it to a radiologist. Of course, if there are ever any findings that seem unusual or that you are unsure about, it's absolutely necessary to send to a radiologist just to be sure. It's always better to be safe than sorry. It's just that it's not necessarily always required to send to a radiologist for such a small field of view. However, it may be like state dependent on some of these rules. So I would definitely check with, um, you know, your governing bodies and things like that, just to be absolutely sure. Excellent. Um, axial images appear flipped after a CBCT scan. Do you ever have a personal trick or do you have a personal trick on how not to get confused between uh, MB or ML? or even number three or number 14? A great question. Um, so usually I'm not confused about whether it's three or 14, like a, a tooth on different sides of the arch. And that's because you're, you're usually the one taking the scan, right? So, and you're asking the patient which side is the side that's like bothering them. And you're using the CBCT in conjunction again with a 2D radiograph. So all the information, whether it's right or left side, that usually isn't mixed up. 
Um, Misio Bako or Misio Lingual, I can definitely understand where it might be uh, hard to distinguish sometimes because it's flipped. So what you want to do is just as you're scrolling, you're keeping an eye on where the, um, like the air, the, what is it called? The crosshairs are. And so you're making sure, okay, it's moving from what, this side to this side when you're moving from, um, mesial to distal and since you're on a certain tooth it has to be the buckle or has to be the lingual it's stuff like that. that that way you can help yourself get oriented if a 2d x-ray shows a well-filled root canal and still has a sinus tract and the tooth is asymptomatic what would the cbct sheet the cbct show great question so it can show you a lot of information, um, kind of like what we were, I had discussed in my previous uh, pictures. So we had talked about how in my other cases, there were some examples of a root canal filling material, but that had um, a tooth that had a root canal filling material, but it had a lesion. And um, we wanted to see why it was having that lesion. So it could be that maybe you're seeing that the lesion's coming from a different area, number one. You can see that maybe that there's a missed canal and actually it is a deep split or a lateral canal or a lot of other missed anatomy that you didn't realize is there that you can't actually see in a 2D radiograph. For example, it's very easy easy to misread 2D radiographs and to think that a lower anterior only has one canal when it actually has two and it can happen in as many as 30% of cases or that it um, that you only have one canal in a lower first molar when there's actually often two canals. And so um, if on a 2D radiograph, it looks like it's okay or it's well filled, it could be that there's missed anatomy that wasn't treated. Additionally, you could have maybe the possibility of an, uh, a root filling material that is actually too large, like the tooth was over instrumented or too much tooth structure was lost and that, um, that there was a strip perforation. Maybe that's why it has a sinus tract, or it could be that it has a fracture or a crack. And maybe the crack is more visible with the CBCT or that the bone loss in the mid root area that is consistent with a vertical root fracture is evident on a CBCT. So there's a lot of possible reasons why a tooth could have um, a sinus tract but be asymptomatic, but actually have a problem even if the root now looks quote unquote good. It could even just have really terrible coronal leakage. That might be another reason why it has a sinus tract. It's just a sinus tract, who knows? All right. Well, I think we got through all the questions. We are, oh, one more here came in. Um, if a tooth is completely calcified and the patient wants internal bleaching, what are their options? That is a great question. So um, it, so I'm not sure if this question means like it's completely calcified and is treatable, like they're do you're doing endodontic treatment or they are not doing endodontic treatment. Um, it it kind of depends. So if a tooth is completely calcified, like complete pulpal obliteration, you can't see the canal at all, you're not going to be able to do non-surgical treatment. You can still do an apico, you can do an apico, seal the end with MTA or some, some other kind of bioceramic material, and then you can then do internal bleaching on top. Internal bleaching would just require for you to do like a simple lingual, uh, sorry, some simple access into the area where the pulp should be. So basically you just want some access to the coronal tooth structure and then you can do the internal bleaching. Otherwise, uh, if you're concerned about the internal bleaching, you could always just do external localized bleaching of just that particular tooth. Um, you could also consider um, if this tooth is treatable, then you just do the endodontic treatment and then do the um, and then do the internal bleaching. So it just kind of depends on what you mean by that question. All right, we'll do one more here because we're a little over time. Um, any tricks on how to decrease CBCT artifacts? Great question. So my biggest tip is number one, you want to set your CBCT image taken. So like, um, where you're taking the CBCT, you want to set it actually slightly past 
the coronal, like any crown margins or restorative margins. So because you want to have less um, artifacts and beam hardening occurring from the um, restorative material. So that prevents a lot of the different artifacts and stuff. Secondly, a, a depending on the machine and which, and which model you have, a lot of them have different either modes or filters or like certain toggles that you can uh, put on that can actually filter out and make you make it be able to be possible to distinguish radio opacity levels like you can see like post versus root canal filling material or it will decrease the beam hardening a little bit so um you have to talk to your cbct manufacturer to see if you a have that option like if you have that filter or that capability and b how to do it it's very machine dependent. That's why a lot of times when I do these CBCT lectures, I generally talk about it from a very general standpoint because a lot of the machines and the the uh, CBCT reading programs, like the computer program that allows you to actually look at it, they will all have very machine and program kind of specific findings. Excellent. All right, Dr. Tran, thank awesome. you so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you Enjoy so your lectures every you time. Well. Oh, thank <laughs> you so much, Adam. It's always such a pleasure working with you and with the whole Henry Shine team. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us tonight uh, and this late night, as well as for going through this lecture. I know there was a lot of information. If you uh, have any questions, definitely let us know. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. And if anyone does want access to any of Dr. Tran's previous webinars, please feel free to email us, webinars at henryshine.com. We did record tonight, so we'll get that out to you in the next week or so. Thank you again to everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. Tran. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.